Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Let's dive in. This is a magical time. I don't want to waste a second. Good afternoon, ladies and some gentlemen. Um, welcome. This last Monday in America, we celebrated Martin Luther King Day. It's a big celebration. But perhaps the question we need to ask ourselves now is who is the next Martin Luther King? Who is the next Gandhi? Who is the next Nelson Mandela? Who are the next generation of inspirational cultural heroes who will lead us towards truth and righteousness? We are facing a sea of white noise, a tsunami of information. And it's becoming so difficult for us to hear those beautiful voices breaking through. So, I am a storyteller, and my job is to find emerging and established leaders with a positive message and give them an amplification and enhanced platform of leadership so their beautiful voices break through to us. So, two years ago, exactly, I stood right here on this spot and I made a presentation of pictures and stories about a man who I believed will become one of these inspirational global phenomenons. His name was Dr. McQuaige, Dr. Dennis McQuaige. And um, in 1999, he built a small hospital in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And uh, since then, at his hospital, he has treated, I think now, over 52,000 women, children, and babies for sexual violence. So it's a very powerful story, and I was so inspired to, to, and privileged to tell it, but I knew I need to do more. So I decided to take the structure of my presentation, and I made a film based on that story. And it took me two years. And uh, about a few days after I finished making the film, I got a call at four o'clock in the morning from a dear friend of mine, Elizabeth Blackney, who's my executive director of my foundation. And she was going crazy. I said, what happened? And she said, the doctors just won the Nobel Peace Prize. Come on. So then the next thing that happened was that the doctor invited me to, to attend the Nobel Peace Prize ceremony in Oslo. And as I sat in the audience with members of his family, I genuinely felt that I did not deserve to be there. So he accepted this incredible award, and then he gave a thunderous speech. That we have had enough, perhaps, of continuous ceremony and symbolism, and even discussion. Now is the time for action. It reminded me of something that Winston Churchill used to do. Winston Churchill, during the Second World War, had a sticker which he used to place on all important documents that said, Action Now. Anyone who received a document from his inner circle would know that this has to be implemented immediately. So in front of you, I put a sticker on this issue because we have to implement action now. So we made the film. And then after hearing his speech about action, I knew that to release the film, I shouldn't do it at one of the film festivals because that is too ceremonial. I needed to be here at Davos in front of you because you are the people that drive action. And I do believe in optimism and I do believe that we are committed to improving the state of the world. So this feels the perfect environment for me to invite the doctor as my guest. So, uh, I'd like for all of you who didn't get to see our world premiere last night screening, uh, I'm going to give you a little sample of the film uh, before we begin our discussion. Uh, guys, would you want to roll cameras?
As we drove in our convoy, my fixer said to me, you know, this country is rich. He said, it's a $24 trillion economy based on natural resource wealth. When I looked out of the window, I saw nothing but poverty and devastation. And I thought to myself, none of that money seems to be going to the people. Suddenly something amazing caught my eye. It was a poster in a market on the street of Dr. McQuaigay's face. And I jumped out of the car so that I could get a photograph. The man in context, surrounded by all his people. Eventually, we made it to the gates of the hospital, the very gates where 85,000 women and children had appeared seeking treatment. Dr. McQuaigay welcomed us with open arms. He is a man who's clearly exhausted by battling this awful epidemic of rape as a weapon of war. And yet when he's surrounded by his people, he seems 200% alive. He sat for me, and here is the icon I hoped to make. A banner for change, an image of courage and compassion. I said to him, Doctor, what makes you happy? And he said, My happiness is the happiness of others. If I can make others happy, so myself I'll be happy. He then invited me and my team to morning prayers and his morning sermon in a place called Maison Dorcas. This is the rehabilitation center attached to the Pansy Hospital, a place where women heal spiritually after having been healed physically. As soon as we walked in with Dr. McQuaigay, the place lit up with joy, strength and courage. It was an incredible phenomenon to witness. He spoke to these women, not in a gentle way, but it was a call to arms to rise above adversity and face these awful dark challenges with strength and courage. I felt like I'm witnessing history. It was a quiet moment of meditation and prayer. The next person I photographed was Esther. She said when she was 16 years old, she was fetching water for her parents in a rural area outside Bukavu. A group of FDLR militia troops grabbed her and abducted her and pulled her into a forest. They tied her to a tree and the whole gang of men raped her for a few days. On the fourth day, the ropes came undone and she managed to escape. She made it to a village and a man rescued her and brought her home. But then that man also raped her. Eventually, she was discarded and thrown out onto the streets and she made it all the way to the gates of the Pansy Hospital for treatment. Dr. Dennis McQuaigie successfully treated her, but found that she was now pregnant from the rape. Here is Esther with her baby Jose, born of rape. As Esther told me this story, I took this picture. But I must admit that I had trouble keeping my composure. And I said to her, you have this stoic dignity and strength. How is it that you're managing to tell me this story and yet you don't cry in my picture? She said, the reason I don't cry is because I don't want to make you feel sad. I don't want anybody to feel sad when they see this image. 
My mummy and daddy, she said, always told me when I was a little girl that I am here to bring joy to the world and I will do everything I can to keep my promise. Ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, it is with profound humility that I invite my friend, my hero, Dr. Dennis McQuaige to have a conversation. Now, um, <clears throat> I've seen many interviews in my time, and I know you've done many interviews in your time. English is not the doctor's first language. French, he speaks beautifully. But um, when he speaks English to me, because of what he calls restrictions, I receive answers that are poetic because it forces Dennis McQuaige to speak in simple terms and reduce uh, the message uh, to something that comes straight from his heart. So uh, we hope you will be... Uh, understanding of the kind of conversations that we're going to have. And it suits me because I'm a very simple man and I don't understand complicated answers anyway. <laughs> so um, everybody always asks you about um, the situation in Congo. Uh, they want to know what's going on on the ground. They also want to know what your solutions are. But... I very rarely hear anyone talk to you about the fact that you are a doctor. Um, many people never dare discuss the fact that you are there when a, a young woman arrives at the gates of your hospital injured and you examine her. Many people are not aware that uh, you are also there as she's being prepared for surgery. You are also the person that performs the surgery and heals her flesh. And you are also the person who she sees first when she wakes up. And then even when perhaps her body has healed, you are the one that helps her heal her soul. So I wanted to ask you something about the intimacy of connection. When a woman wakes up after surgery, what would she say when she sees you? I thank you, Platon, for this question. I think that one thing who really uh, is touching me uh, when I'm treating patients coming to my hospital. Most of them, when they come to the hospital, they are in really a very, very bad condition. To spend weeks, sometime, months in the bush, be raped by many gang rape. So when they come to the hospital, they are in a very bad condition. And sometimes, some of them need to go through operation. And uh, I've seen many women, uh, when they come to the hospital, just my feeling was how she will succeed because she, she's in a very bad condition, destroyed. And uh, I was wondering, if, even if we treat her, how she will cope with the situation she went through. And most of the time, when I make this sometimes difficult operation, it can take me six, eight hours sometimes. I was so touching to see that women, when they wake up, they're not wake up, when they wake up, it's not for, for themselves. And when you, they ask the first question is, how is my child? How is my husband? How is my family? And this is really so touching for me because I use also to treat men. And I can see that when men wake up, the question is, how when the operation? <laughs> What is my future after this operation? <laughs> but 
women are thinking more about others in spite to, to think about themselves. And for me, I think that really, this is so touching me and pushing me to, to try to do as much as I can for so, women in my hospital. So, um, we've talked a lot about the difference between men and women. And there's been much discussion around the world these days about this incredible new movement that, uh, of, of women's empowerment. Um, there's a, a scene in the film, uh, which we won't show because I want to talk to him, but uh, there was a scene where I went into a jail uh, and I photographed men who were accused of extreme sexual violence. And the policeman uh, let them out of their jail cell for a few minutes so that I could do this picture because I wanted to see that side of the story. Otherwise, it remains a mystery. And, of course, when the man sat in front of me, and when I showed this in the... ...covered his face in shame. And when I showed this in the movie, you responded to that picture, and you also responded to a picture I took of a young woman who was a survivor of sexual violence, and when I photographed her, she did not cover her face in shame. She stood proud, noble, and dignified, and courageous, because she wanted her face to be an example of courage for everybody else. Can you talk to me about what that meant to you, because something happened in your mind that something crystallized. Yeah, uh, when I saw this film and I saw these two images, I think something happened in me and I say, oh, this is really a good beginning of the fight against sexual violence. Because most of the time, and, and in many countries, I travel a lot in many countries and I can see that when uh, it happens that a woman um, is raped, the shame is on the women. And the way that men are treating women is like the body of women belong to men, to the community. So the women have to feel a shame when, when she's raped. And this is a way also uh, is keeping rape in our society because women can't talk um, freely about rape because they know that uh, the consequence will be to be excluded, maybe sometime to be killed. Uh, the crime of honor exists in some, in some places in the world. So it's very dangerous for women to talk about rape. Even, in, even if they are victims, they can't talk freely about what's happened for them. And yesterday I told you, you know, when it happened to children, parents feel more responsibility and you can see that in less than 24 hours, when just they, they can see that it happened directly, they have to come to the hospital or to the police to complain. But when it, it happened to adults, most of the time is the question, what will happen with my husband? What will happen with my, my community? How others will think about me? It's happened because I, I, I like it or so it's always questions about what happened. So women are suffering for the social norms. And these social norms bring that women have feel a shame when it happened for them. But there I saw one thing wonderful. To see that men hide his face and the victim stand up and talk freely to say, it happened to me, it was a bad thing. They tried to destroy me, but I still alive and I love even my, my child. And this is a courage to show that we can shift the same, the shame from women to perpetrators, but we have to work on it so it can happen everywhere. So in normal leadership ideology, we think that um, the man is in a dominant position. Uh, and in that picture, 
the male and female role was reversed, and also the, the victim and the victor was reversed. Exactly. Um, so this leads me to a, a, a question that people ask me a lot. With the new uh, movement for women's empowerment, particularly the Me Too movement, um, how should men behave now? Many people say that men are concerned. They, they are uh, a little anxious. They don't know, how, maybe they shouldn't be so confident. Uh, how should they respond to women in the workplace? What is the role of a man? And some men say they might be threatened by this uh, women's empowerment. We talked about this yesterday, and you said some am amazing things. But wh what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that what is keeping rape in our society is silence. Because when a uh, rapist knows that, women will never talk about it because she will face consequences of what happened to her. So I think that women will just keep silence. But in silence, she can be raped again and again. Mm -hmm. and in this condition, she can't also protect others against this rapist because he can do it with others in, in the family or in the, in the society. So silence is really a strong tool for rapists to use for they can go on destroying girls and women. So to, f and, to fight the system, silence and, is one of the most important things And I think that to break. when really we can give um, the world to women to be able to talk about what happened to them, mm -hmm. I think that this will be, and it's a strong toll because there, all men before to, to do a rape, he will think twice because he knows that it will not be a secret. It will happen, and the women will talk about it. And really, I think that men don't have to feel that uh, it's a threat. I think that many men are not rapists. Most of men are not rapists. It's just a small number of men who are rapists. And this small number, I think that they are protected by the other men who are not rapists. You can see the solidarity of men when it comes to rape. Men are always, uh, what he say, soldier to other men. Mm -hmm. And I think that the only one way to move and try to end sexual violence is really to give women the possibility to talk and to don't be victim because they just denounce when it happened. And this, I think that, for example, the movement Me Too or Black Silence and so on, all this movement, we should really, we men, we should be behind and just support because I know that all the men are not rapists and it's a way to create a new way to see. I can say it's a positive masculinity and we have really to ban the uh, masculinity, uh, dominant masculinity who are just put in to say that men are completely, uh, uh, they are not equal to men, to women. I mean, I've never met um, someone who is as much a champion for women and women's rights as you, and you are a man. Um, and uh, you won the Nobel Peace Prize, so there are benefits um, <laughs> for the men who are on the fence. Um, so. Um, on a serious note, uh, let's go very deep into the human condition because you, again, going back to you as a doctor, a doctor heals, but you said something to me recently that r really got me and I actually teared up at the lunch table and I tried not to do it in front of you but I, I kept it inside because I'm a man. Um, I asked you about what happens in surgery when, and, and after surgery when a woman wakes up and you answered that beautifully. But you said, 
that sometimes you're not successful in the operation and you can't fix the damage that has been done. Can you talk? I know it's a sensitive subject, but can you talk about that? Because there's a sensitive people here. This is a safe place to talk about the human condition. Yeah. You know, most of the victims I'm treating at the hospital are very young. And uh, talking with victims, you, uh, you have to bring them to, to believe in you. And this trust is, trust. is just coming very, very quickly with women at the hospital. And when I'm discussing with, with women, the big question, because when their, their genital is destroyed, sometimes they're linking, they can't get the control of their own body. And this is a terrible thing because they are excluded from their own community because they can't get the control of their, their body. And what do you feel like? Yeah. When you can't succeed? Exactly. I'm coming to, to this. And uh, when, before to make the operation, you know that uh, this uh, young girl was destroyed. So she didn't get really her childhood. And she asked you, doctor, what will happen for me? After the operation, can you confirm me that I will be able to be as other women? Or can you tell me if I will got children after this operation? And when you are operating, sometimes you can face a, really a big problem that you have just uh, nothing to, to make this reparation so she can recover her femininity. I can tell you that for me, it's a torture. As a surgeon, when she wake up and I have to tell her that it was not possible to fix, for example, the continence because all the urethra was completely destroyed. And just know that I'm telling her that you didn't got your childhood and you'll never get your femininity. It's terrible. Not only for, for the victim, but also for, you. for me. Um, because I can just be in her position and feel what she's feeling to see that her life is completely destroyed by someone who lose his humanity in the way to treat her. And you mentioned that there is a, a mechanism in our humanity, and in some cases there is a, you can trigger a mechanism of violence, and this is what often causes this problem. It's a trigger. Yeah, exactly. I think that we are not, as human, we are not really created to, to be violent. And uh, when uh, you are in face of someone who is facing, who uh, is facing maybe something very uh, suffering, I think that all of us, you can feel also bad about what happened or the suffering of another person. This is an empathy. Empathy. And, empathy. and you have this empathy. But sometimes, and especially with the pressure of our society where men have to be different. Mm -hmm. Men, don't, to, for to dominate mm -hmm. others, you don't need to get compassion. You, you need to be violent so you can, be, uh, you can dominate another, another, excuse me, another person. Mm -hmm. And I think that in losing this empathy, in you, you lose this capacity to see another person as yourself and feel the same inside you mm. when some, someone is suffering in front of you. And I think that this, 
the lack of this empathy is the way that our society creates the way we can dominate women and, and just think that I need to be violent to protect myself. I need, I need to be violent to put rule on place. I need to be violent and so on. But I think that this is not the way that we are created. Men and the women, we should be empathetic. But you can see that the way that we are, uh, we grow up, men most of the time is to tell us, you are a man, you can't cry. You are a man, you can't get emotion. It's not normal. We should get all emotion. And if and you don't- should be proud. Proud, yeah, to, to get emotion because- Sign of strength. Exactly. I, I think for me, for me, I'm crying, and it's not a shame for me because I, I just feel that I can put myself in the position of the person on front of me who is suffering. It's not a shame, but, but in the education, most of the time in my, in my, in my country is to say, a man can't cry. A man must be strong. A man must dominate. And I think that this is a way really to be, to dominate women and to be violent with women, to show that we are strong, intelligent, and, and so on. And it's not true. It's just a way to get control looking, of, looking back, of women. Looking back, you said historically, and a general statement, but I believe it, that men have always fought to dominate, and women have always fought to be equal and to share. Ex and to be equal and to share is the, the highest um, thing to aim for, not to dominate. Exactly. And in the hospital, you can see it clear, as yeah. I said at the beginning. You can see that when, when I said about when a woman wake up, the reaction is, how are others around me? To take care of others is to share also. Is to share. Is to share. But women is how I can be more strong to dominate. Mm. So how will be my future? How I will function after this operation? Mm. And I think that this is clear. It's not something that we have in our DNA. It's created by the social norms for only Violence dominate. in culture, e exactly. video games, TV, it's like this exactly. sort of glamorization of violence as well. And masculinity, this forced masculinity. Toxic masculinity. Toxic, <laughs> toxic exactly. See, he's, I told you, it's poetic. <laughs> um, so we, we're running out of time. I could talk here in front of these amazing people for hours, um, but uh, we, we're running out of time. So. Um, I want to ask you one last question before I get in big trouble with my friends at World Economic Forum. Um, you once said a word to me that was reparation. What does that mean? Yeah, uh, I want to say that uh, I travel uh, in many countries where the war happened and um, talking with women, I think that one thing that I find is that maybe they can access to the treatment. But the big question is the reparation. And this reparation is, for me, a way to get the healing for victim of sexual violence. It is to be recognized by the community, by the society, that we were wrong to don't protect you. So we need to do a reparation for our lack of protection. And I think that in many countries, this discussion is really a very big discussion because even countries don't want really to do this reparation. And I know that in the country where there is a war, women should be protected. And if it don't happen, I think that all of us, we should take responsibility because we have this responsibility to protect each other. And when it don't happen, we need to do this reparation but it's so hard to get it. And I just want to make a call. My organization is working now to get a global fund for, the, a global fund for reparation. It don't uh, care if uh, women come from Africa or Europe or America. I think that the reaction of women are the same when this happened. 
So we should get a solidarity with the women around the world and create this global fund for if the government or the one who did this damage can't do it for a reason or another, the world should be, uh, get this solidarity to make this reparation. And when we talk about reparation, many people have the impression that reparation is, is to distribute money. No, when I got discussion with women, I was so surprised to see that. For many women, reparation is only some time to ask that the leaders can just apologize for what happened. Reparation can be also for some women to, to build a memorial, mm -hmm. to just say, this is enough. To acknowledge. And, and to acknowledge and put it somewhere in a village or in a town to say, in this town we don't accept again that women can be raped. And I think that this we can do it if we join our forces. Thank you. Thank you. I know, um, firstly, I know you're standing, not, not, certainly not for me. Uh, I know you're standing for him, but I would like to say you're also...